So Steve gave a talk about his SDT Ethereum tool a while back. This is a, a command line for the Ethereum, I think, the way you described it. So I guess I could give further introduction. Oh, yes, so maybe of Steve himself. So Steve is an economist and a blogger. You can see him on interfluidity.com. Uh, let's see. Uh, um, uh, let's see. He's been cited by the National Review and uh, Paul Krugman, kind of different ends of the political spectrum, his blog. Uh, let's see. I don't know. So his blog is, uh, is has some visibility. This blog on economics has some visibility in the world. So, but the, so I guess if you have economics questions, then that I think Steve might be interested in, in discussing those afterwards as well. So. Please, Steve. I feel like I, I want to give you know you as generous an introduction. You get to do all the introducing and the generosity. It doesn't seem fair. <laughs> uh, well, you so know. you've been pulling this group together for all of the I don't know five years I've been coming to it. So Steve, would you, you like know. to be an organizer? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm already. Uh, I have a I have a role in a related okay, organization. Right, well, so. So yeah, I'm just saying that if you be. really want to be appreciative, well, then I can provide a way for you to be appreciative <laughs> of being organized. Okay. Well, let's table that, okay. as it were. Um, so this talk, there's sort of there, there's sort of um, two things going on here. One is just, um, I, I know a bunch of you were at um, my last talk a few weeks ago about SBT Ethereum, the software that I'm that I've been working on, and I'm really grateful that people are willing to devote some of their time to learning something about it. Um, and so part of it is, I think, just an exercise to get people a little bit comfortable playing around with that and um, seeing if they find it as interesting and exciting as I hope somebody will. Um, and then the other is um, uh, ENS. Um, so I do mean to at least do some reasonable job of explaining how ENS works, since that's the ostensible topic of the talk. So I'm kind of going to weave between, I think, those two roles as sort of SPT Ethereum tutorial and ENS lecturing. So um, I think I'll start a little bit with the um, tutorial stuff. A few things, as last time, I'm going to want at some point there to be a way for you to tell me where I need to send you money. Um, because if you get far enough that you're interacting with SPT Ethereum and you want to send um, transactions to the Ethereum network, you'll need a little bit of Ether um, to interact with it. Um, so um, this um, GitHub, my name, this is my GitHub, swaldman slash ENS talk is for tonight. Um, it has a little readme that shows you just a little bit about how to get Ethereum, SPT Ethereum set up on your machine, um, and it has this issue um, here, or in the issues, it's just an issue, and when you have an Ethereum address and you need a little bit of ether there so that you can play, just add the address to this issue and I'll send you like 0.01 ether or something like that, which would be enough to play around with. Um, so that's a thing to look at. The other thing to look at um, on the SBT Ethereum side are, of course, its documentation, which is sptethereum.io. Um, I, since since my UI is not self-explanatory, I always want to call people's attention to the fact that there is a page table of contents that always shows up at the bottom left corner, which is not the most obvious place for it, but it's helpful in navigating around. Um, the getting started in less compact terms basically tells you to do the same things that the README and ENS talk tells you to do. The one thing that's a little bit different that I haven't really documented anywhere in the documentation is sort of an obvious thing when you think about it, since that I've said I use this convention of having a branch for every version of ETH command line. But a nice thing about that is if, for example, you um, are continuing where you left off last time, 
if you've downloaded ETH command line before and are continuing where you left off, you can upgrade to the latest version. There have been two versions since that last talk, one of them due to my embarrassment over having broken something um, just before the talk, and then another one due to my enthusiasm about getting ENS stuff working, so I got a new ENS feature working and cleaned up a bunch of things, um, is that you can just um, um, check out a new branch, right? If you clone ETH command line onto your machine, um, the way to upgrade or downgrade is just to check out the version number as a branch, no V in front of it, just the version number, 0 0.3.4 is the current version number. So it's very easy to upgrade um, if you already have it on your machine. Mostly things will work either way, but um, I have been working on it, so I like people using the newer stuff if possible. Um, okay, so that's some stuff to get started with. Um, I'll let you kind of work on that on your own, and I'll do a little bit of ENS overview, and then the two threads will come together fairly shortly. I, my goal is that pretty much everybody who wants to play, who's interested in following along, I hope will be able to register a name. Um, so we'll do that, and then we'll see how far we get beyond that. So ENS, um, do you guys know what it is? I bet some do, some don't. It's intended to be, it's one of several competitors now in the blockchain universe, um, but it's intended to be kind of a blockchain analog of DNS, so the domain name system that lets us use human-friendly names rather than ugly IP addresses to find our internet resources. Um, in Ethereum, most resources are accessed by Ethereum addresses, which are typically 40 byte, bytes expressed as hex, and that's a pretty ugly way to try to keep track of resources, easy to get wrong. Um, so the first and most simple thing that ENS is, is just a mapping between names and Ethereum addresses. Um, it has grander ambitions than that. Um, sort of like DNS, if you follow DNS, you know that there's a little bit more than just a mapping of names to numbers. A bunch of other things sometimes get hung off of the names, like where internet, where email should go to for a domain or things like that. So ENS is designed to be fairly general, um, and it's recently sort of generalizing itself. So um, this is a, an overview of the architecture of ENS. Um, it's it's actually quite elegant, um, although looking at this, it looks more complicated than it needs to be. It is both elegant and complicated, I would say. Um, as, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But the main thing, an important thing to know, is that there's only one sort of root to the whole ENS system. Everything else can change. But this piece, the ENS, it's referred to as ENS, and it's the... Um, gateway to the top level domain ETH. You can run the ENS smart contracts on other Ethereum or Ethereum like, like networks. It's all open source. Um, but for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to presume that we are working with the canonical ENS that's installed on the main Ethereum network for the top level domain ETH. Um, and this one piece, this black box, is a permanent fixture. Um, so um, the only address you need to bootstrap the whole system is this one here. Um, and you can see it's sort of a vanity address. They kind of mined private keys till they found one that begins with 314159. Right? So, what's that? 265. Yeah, I don't even know beyond that. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so, a few, you know, a nice, a nice pie-ish pre prefix. It's not enough to... Um, for you to get everywhere you want to go, um, but it's a good start. Um, okay, so this is the root of the ENS system, um, and the architecture is mostly pretty simple, and it's analogous to, to um, DNS. The main thing that the ENS does is it lets you look up for names, resolvers, if you think of what like a top-level domain 
does in DNS, right? It tells you the name servers for individual subnames. And then resolvers let you ask questions like, what's the address associated with this name? And what are other resources associated with this name? The only reason for these other boxes at the top um, are there's got to be a way to register the domains, right? So this is sort of, again, like ENS, if you want a .com name or something, you've got to go to somebody. ENS is uh, a quasi-decentralized, a semi-centralized, it's hard to say. It's managed by smart contracts, but the smart contracts are ultimately controlled by a multi-sig with a bunch of prominent people from the Ethereum ecosystem capable of modifying a lot. Um, but it's basically a decentralized application, and except for when they sort of come in and do something unusual. Um, so that's a smart contract, and it's got a bunch of methods. The most important one is this resolver method that lets you find the resolver for um, a name. And if you use resolver for the top level domain itself, for the main name, you get the resolver that's kind of responsible for managing the resources associated with DNS as a whole. Um, and that's the registrar that registers new names. But typically, when you actually want to use names, there's a friendlier version of the registrar called a controller. Um, and that's what you do the registering in. So we'll look at those interfaces in a second. And we're going to go through this stuff pretty quickly, not because it's easy, but because it's not so interesting. One thing to notice is that at this level, there's lots of hex, right? It's lots of, um, there's, there's lots of stuff going on that's, you know, ugly in the way that something like DNS is trying to hide. There's interesting things about it. Um, it uses some Ethereum ideas or standards of reflective access to different smart contracts where smart contracts declare that they inter that they implement certain interfaces or their gateways to proxies that implement certain interfaces. So this resolver, you can ask the resolver whether it knows of something that implements a certain interface for the name ETH and it will tell you about its controller. If you ask for a controller interface, if you ask for um, uh, non-fungible token interface, it will tell you the registrar um, because ENS names conform to the non-fungible token standard in Ethereum. So that's the architecture in a nutshell. Um, one minor point that's worth understanding is the names are hierarchical names, but they're not represented by names, they're represented by hashes. In almost everything I'm saying in this part of the talk, you don't actually have to know to use DNS. Um, but since I did promise to demystify it, I'm going through a little bit of the technical architecture. Um, so like most things in blockchain world, we don't identify things by long strings. Long strings are expensive to store and manage on a blockchain. We hash things and then use those hashes as the identifiers or tokens. Um, for the things that we're interested in. So that's true of DNS. Ultimately, when you look up a resolver, when you look up an address, when you look up at anything, you supply a key, and the key is a hash. It's not a name directly. Um, but there's a problem, or there would be a problem, with simply using hashes for names in that ENS wants to enforce very different policies for a name like Decentralization Foundation .eth, or a name like Chris Decentralization Foundation .eth, right? Decentralization Foundation .eth has to be purchased from this one canonical namespace, the top ETH namespace, the .eth namespace, whereas Chris Decentralization Foundation .eth, once Chris owns that top level name, he should be able to do what he wants with it. But if all the system saw was, okay, I want to attach a resolver or an address or something to a hash, the system doesn't know whether that represents a top-level name or whether that represents a subname. Um, so it's important to define a notion of a hierarchical hash, um, where basically 
you can present the system with a name that it, with a hash that it presumes is a top level name and a label, right? So in this case, birthday.eve is a top level name and the label happy. And it can take this top level hash, a hash that it sees just on its own, it presumes it's top level. It's not going to let you do anything with it unless it already knows that you own it. Um, but if, if you give it a top level ETH, it can check and say, okay, well, somebody owns birthday.eth and they want to make the subnode happy. Um, then it can say, okay, I have the label called happy and this top level called birthday.eth, but it doesn't even have birthday.eth, it just has a hash of birthday.eth. It can take those two strings, a string happy and the hash of something that it's already allocated, that it knows belongs to somebody, and say, okay, that person can then set the thing that's made by combining the label happy with birthday.eth hash that they already know. Right? So there needs to be this notion of a hash that's hierarchical, where I can take a parent version of the hash and a label, present it to the ENS system. The ENS system can verify that I already own the parent version of the hash, so it doesn't have to worry about whether or not I'm allowed to allocate it, and then it can let me allocate this new hash that it understands to be a child of that. So that's something called name hash, and it's a fairly simple idea, but that's more than understanding the details, you'll have the slides. I'll attach this to the meetup after the talk if you're interested in understanding the details. Um, but that's the basic idea. If, you, if they had just used hashes for every name, if happy.birthday.eth, if they just hashed happy.birthday.eth and hashed birthday.eth, the, the system would never be able to tell that those two things are related. and would never be able to be like, oh, okay, you already own birthday.eth, so you can do what you want with happy.birthday.eth. But by recursively constructing new hashes from parent hashes, the system can say, okay, if you own the parent hash, then I can let you do what you want with this hash you constructed as a child. Um, and, um, and that's what it does. So if you own a domain like birthday.eth, you can make as many subnodes of it as you want. You can make subnodes of your subnodes and so on. Um, the other interesting thing about the hash function is unsurprisingly, um, it, you want the things that get hashed to be normalized a little bit. So ENS wants to be case insensitive. So it's important that before you hash things like birthday or ETH that you normalize it, normalize all the lower case. And if you've ever paid attention to like ENS crap, there are like issues, well, what do you do about people who want to put, you know, not like conventional US ASCII characters in names. Um, and so the hashing function, the normalization function inherits, what's it called? It's like called puny code, international domain name conventions um, that it uses to normalize each of the labels. So you take a label, um, you, you start out with the root hash is defined to be all zeros, and then to construct a parent hash, uh, to construct a child hash of that, you take a label, you normalize it to lowercase, and this international domain stuff, and it has weird characters, you take that hash, you concatenate it with the parent hash, um, and then you've got it done. I've, I've done something stupid here. Uh, this is this is wrong. This should say tech 256, right? So it's using the, the this is much too recursive. <laughs> um, so this is the tech 256 hash. Um, I'll correct that before I give this out. So the Keck 256 hash is a hash that Ethereum uses for everything. So you might call it ethash. It's a hash that Ethereum uses for its transactions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you just take the hash, the Keck hash, of the parent's hash that you already have, the normalized child, and then you get the child's hash. So you get this nice characteristic that domain names are insensitive and that the system can tell when you're doing something with a child of something already owned, so it can permit things without your having to register new, new names. Um, okay, these are the interfaces. Um, I don't want to spend too much time trying to go through interfaces. It's sort of ugly, but from, for the most part, this is ENS, it's the root. Um, and really, these two functions are basically the gateway to the whole system, um, owner and resolver. So for any ENS name that's already owned, 
you can ask the ENS object. This is that one that sits at pi on the blockchain under the under the um, hash pi. You can ask it for a name hash, one of those hashes. Um, you can ask it for the owner of the name. Um, and then you can ask it for the resolver, if a resolver's been set, which is the thing that says, OK, this name is associated with an address if you send money to it. Um, this thing is associated with some text. This thing, the latest thing that's new that I just implemented in SPT Ethereum is this thing can be associated with a Bitcoin address too, not just a, an Ethereum address. All the other things that a, that a name can be associated to besides its owner is managed by the resolver. Um, we'll see that in just a minute. Um, so this is the main gateway. Um, oh, that's probably not the right way to do it. Um, the registrar, I think we're not going to spend too much time going through. The interesting thing about it is that the main things you want to do um, on a registrar are these things down here, which are about like um, setting registering names and renewing names. Um, and in the implementation of the registrar, it has this sort of public interface, but the implementation of the registrar restricts those functions to a controller, right? So in our original architecture diagram, we had this registrar and we had the controller. The registrar is what actually registers things, um, but the only thing with permissions to do that actual registration is the controller. So when you're working with ENS by hand, or if you're implementing some kind of application that works with ENS, um, you interact with the controller, not with the registrar directly. Um, okay. Um, this, I don't want to spend much time on it, especially since it's tiny and terrible, but it's just a way of pointing out that the registrar is also an ERC721 token interface. Um, which is the interface people use to like trade collectibles, non-fungible tokens, certificates, things like that. Um, so you can, when you transfer names, you can transfer it like any so-called non-fungible token or coin. Um, okay. Um, resolver. Interesting thing about a resolver is it's got lots and lots of functionality, but it is very reflective in a way, in that when you're doing anything remotely unusual with it. You're not supposed to call functions on it until you have gotten permission to do so by checking and verifying that it supports um, the functionality that you want. And that turns out to be actually important in practice because over time, as ENS has grown, they have continually added functionality to the ENS system to find, oh, okay, we want to be able to hang, you know, your grandmother's name off of a name, whatever. So they set up, you know, some functions for, you know, find grandmother's name from a hash. Let's look at what these functions <coughs> look like. Um, I wonder if I can just make them a little bit bigger like this. Right, so there are, you know, all these things. Um, you can attach an ABI of a smart contract now to a um, to an ENS name. The address, this is addresses for an Ethereum address. This new one is with a coin type. That's how you can attach Bitcoin or other coin addresses to it. A content hash, you can associate a name with some content using a kind of some kind of content as addressable store like um, um, uh, inter, uh, interplanetary IPFS, um, that kind of system that uses a hash as a key. Um, all of these different things, attach public keys to names, some arbitrary text, all of these different things have been sort of somebody's like, oh, it'd be really cool if we could, you know, have ENS names refer to this too. And so they change the interface, they add it to the resolver. But what that means is it means, well, if you are using an older resolver, that functionality won't be supported. Or maybe you don't wanna, you're, maybe you're writing your own resolver and all you wanna do is be able to attach an address to your name. That's really the main use case for ENS and you don't care about all this stuff and you don't wanna write it. Um, so um, this function down here supports interface. It's based on an EIP. Um, Ethereum has a standard way of taking a function 
and converting it into a four byte identifier. Um, and so most of the time these interfaces are just defined as single functions, in which case you just call this thing and say, oh, does it support that function? And if it says yes, you know you can call the function. If it says no, you can't. Um, sometimes the interfaces are more than one function. When they're more than one function, the, the um, identifiers of the functions are just XORed together to make an interface ID. Um, so we saw in the first slide there were a bunch of places where you could ask for certain interfaces by these four byte IDs. Again, as a user of VNS, you never have to really think about this, but it's interesting to know the architecture. It's super flexible because it also has this thing here called interface implementer, which means that if you come up with some completely random thing that you want to hang off of an ENS, of an ENS name, um, you just, you know, you're doing an application that is never going to be standardized into, you know, the giant Ethereum ecosystem or something, but you really want to be able to, you want to make your car addressable over the Ethereum network for some reason so that people can assassinate you by sending, you know, funds to your car or something, right? And so you, you, want, to, you want to basically be able to associate the hash of an ENS name with your car, you define an interface for that, and then you don't have to have these non, some non-standard function in your resolver. You can just define an interface for the association that you want, and you can tell your clients, all you have to do is ask my very standard resolver um, for the interface that implements, say, car associations for my name, right? So, um, interface implementer will give you an address that's kind of like a proxy or a facade, some smart contract out there that delegates the hand, that this resolver delegates the handling for any non-standard functionality. Um, and it's not even always non-standard because as we saw, the, that's a trick that the ENS architecture itself uses quite aggressively, right? So um, you get the resolver for ETH and then when you want the registrar or you want the controller, you ask ENS's resolver for the thing it delegates to for that for e either of those interfaces. So it's a super, it's, it's elegant and flexible, if a little bit daunting to people trying to sort of do this stuff by hand. So um, that's a little bit of a trade-off, but it's very elegant and flexible. You can attach any arbitrary information that you want to an ENS name, define your own interface for how you do it um, using, um, using that functionality. Okay, and then finally, this is what you actually use when you want to register a name. You get the controller. So we saw earlier that the, that the, um, the existing implementation of the standard registrar restricts access, only lets its controllers do things and the controller does kind of what you expect that it should do, right? You want to register a name. Um, <coughs> the controller lets you give, use simple names so you don't have to do the pre-hashing. Um, you give it the simple name, um, the owner, um, who you want to register it for. Um, and it's always a controller for some parent name. So this is the control. Usually when we inter interact with the controller, we're interacting with the controller for the .eth top level domain. So if we want to register Decentralization Foundation, for example, we just put the name Decentralization Foundation in here, the owner, some address of Chris's, a duration in seconds, and then a secret. Okay, so what's that secret all about? We'll see when we do this by hand, well, we, when we do this in SPT Ethereum, first using its tooling, um, there's actually kind of a strange two-step process to registering ENS names. Um, so in order to register an ENS name, first you decide the name that you want and who you want to register it to, and you make up 32 random bytes and keep it secret. And you get from that a kind of hash of all of that. That's your... Um, commitment. And then you have to commit that. And then you have to wait at least one minute in the current, you're supposed to look up how long you're supposed to wait. Um, somewhere here, I think I might have truncated them away. Um, but there are functions that you can call to look up the minimum commitment period and the um, 
maximum commitment period. Right now the minimum commitment period is one minute and the maximum commitment period is 24 hours. Um, you commit your little secret and then you have to wait at least a minute and then, only then, can you call register supplying here the same secret that you use to generate your commitment. What's, what's the reason for this little delay there? Yeah, so it's cumbersome and it seems dumb. Um, the reason is, I'm not going to opine on whether or not it was the right set of choices, but the reason for it is a concern about front running. So the idea is this, when you, when you, because this interface is friendly in the sense that you literally send to the Ethereum network the name as a string that you want to register, there's a real danger that some smart aleck out there could be like sitting around monitoring the Ethereum transaction pool for calls to the registrar looking for names that seem cool and then would try to front run you, right? Like to send the same registration transaction for the same name with a higher gas price to get a higher priority and get the name maybe because they realize it's a cool name or just maybe because they want to hold it for ransom and make you pay up to get the name. Right, so this whole that trick, what's that? That happens with DNS. Yeah, um, it's, it's it's not it's the front running attacks are pretty common, okay, and so so the the basic idea the the delay period means that once you've made that commitment, um, since nobody else can see the secret, they can't call the register without making their own commitment. And that takes at least a minute. So you get one minute of protection from front running in this current architecture. But I guess the, the, the secret is putting you some sort of hash to protect like your um, the, the name that you're trying to, you know, your name is not going to be visible in the transaction. Oh, no, no, no. It's, it's, your, your, your name is hash. visible in the transaction. That's the thing. It's, there's no way around that, right? Ah. So you call this function here make commitment and you supply the name as a string. Okay, so it is, it is going to be visible. Okay. So but the the trick is all of these things are visible and then the commitment is committed to the smart contract. It's not really that the secret is secret. Maybe it's about nothing is secret once you send it to a smart contract in Ethereum. It's just that the commitment that you generate includes a hash not only of your secret but of the name and the owner. So somebody else could come in and front run you and reuse your commitment to register the name to you. But can't right? the miner just grab that and pre-register it for themselves? Well, that's a, they, the thing is, is they can't register it for themselves. So when you, I'm sorry, when you call make commitment, I, I, I just said something that was full of shit, actually. Make commitment is a pure function. So that means you don't actually have to send it to the blockchain. Okay, so that was full of shit of me. It, it is a secret. Um, so you call make secret yourself, even though you're calling it on the smart contract, when you call read-only functions on a smart contract, you don't have to send it to the network. You can send it locally to your own node, right? We, we'll do that if we mess around with interacting with smart contracts. It's a pure function. You call this, nobody sees it. Then you call the commitment. But, but um, your make commitment returns this bytes, which, which is not, it returns this, uh, this long string, which kind of hides the... I mean, it's a function of your secret and your name and the owner, but it's not like directly including them, or, or is it? So, um, the, the, this, this commitment text, this byte 32 commitment there. The, the, the byte 32 commitment is like a hash of these three things. Okay, great. Right? Great. And right, so the, the idea is basically that commitment is visible. That's okay, what I was trying great. to say. So somebody that. else can, re can use that commitment, or they could try to use that commitment the only the commitment will only work if they register the name to you, right? They would actually have to see the secret to do it. But even if they did see the secret, it wouldn't actually be a big deal because the commitment once you've sent in the commitment, um, right? That's only good for you. They have to restart the process if they want to register. Right. Thank so you. it gives you one minute right now because the minimum wait time is one minute. It gives you one minute of front running protection. That's what this two step thing does. Now they. The minimum um, commitment period is variable in the sense that they have the power to change that over time. So if they find, for example, that front running is a big problem, you know, they had to make an arbitrary choice. Thought people are going to hate this. It's annoying to have to go through this two-step process and then wait before you can get a name registered. Um, 
But if we don't do something like this, people will front run. They decided to start out at a minute, basically to see how big of a problem front running is. If it gets to be a bigger problem, they'll make a longer minimum commitment period. The length of that minimum period is the length of front running protection that you have. Um, it's again a sort of important thing about um, this architecture that only this piece is permanent, only the root. Everything else in this system can be replaced out by the multi-sig that kind of owns the system, right? So they can change the controller to one that has a, to one that offers a longer commitment period if front running becomes a big problem. Yeah? So how is ENS communication and the ENS? Like I'm going on in the DNS world, that became a huge problem in you know, today in the internet domain world. There's got too many versions that have no random transaction between them, no random transaction with them. And people yeah. in the past would all this up to get to a phantom ENS to actually steal the data. And you pay no hash because they don't pay. So, how the back between ENS and ENS itself being connected? So, everything that happens over the ENS system, other than things like that kind of function, your lookups can be private because you can do your lookups, the read only functions on a node. Right, so you have your own node, it's a decentralized system. Um, so you don't have to say hit a centralized server and get on server log like you do in DNS, right? With DNS, you're always hitting a server, you're hitting the top level name server often, and then you're hitting a name server that is managed by the domain registrant. There are lots of opportunities for surveillance. In the ENS architecture, it's a decentralized application. Every node has a full copy of the full system. Um, so if you're concerned about your privacy, your lookups can be perfectly private if you run your own node, right? The only person who yeah. lookups is, 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 is how you request an injury. How from here to here is so the DNS in the beginning, if they know all about all this security problem, they don't even have random joining. I remember they don't have random joining number in the period of 96 or something like that. Between two DNS a DNS domain. And now people actually pass the search payload as the payload to the other end. You know, give it a hack in. But that don't apply here, but I know it's distributed. So that means each of them deprecate the whole network DNS register at a given time. They'll deprecate that. I mean, this doesn't have that basic set of problems because of the decentralized architecture. The person, if you're doing lookups, local should, local is easy. Local, to, <coughs> what happened is the one that passed through the group in my name is, yeah. had to figure out, I mean, is the client have to go talk to this guy? Okay, this one is no good. I talk to that one only to find out this thing is special register or not. Or I have to go from this ENS, yes, go to the back communicate and now. Right, so users never have to talk to anyone other than their own node. Okay. And the only things that get published in any sort of Ethereum application are things that are gonna change the state. So anything that you're doing that's read-only can be as private as you want it to be. If you run your own node. If you don't run your own node, then you're open to whoever runs the node. All your lookups can be as private as you want them to be. Anything that you're doing that changes the state of the blockchain is effectively public, right? Because that's gotta be published to all of those other nodes running. So that's the kind of the basic security and privacy mode. Um, okay, um, so I think we're mostly through the architecture. Um, we did resolver, this is controller, the two-step thing. Um, so now this is SPT Ethereum, the hands-on stuff, tries to make it relatively easy um, to do all of these things. Um, I want to do, before we talk through the commands, I think I have this Maybe it's the next slide, but it's really important to know this. So a yes name has an owner and an address, and those are two really different things, even though they're both Ethereum addresses. I think this is kind of the most confusing thing about ENS to people, because in Ethereum, pretty much all identifiers of people or anything like people or organizations are Ethereum addresses. Um, so um, the it's a little bit different than DNS, right? In DNS, nobody would confuse me with my website, 
right? Nobody would try to like look for my web page and instead send the send the request to me as a human who owns a domain name. But in ENS, the owner of the domain is represented by an address. But then the domains themselves, via the by, via the resolver, also have an address. Right? You can ask for the address of a name, um, and you get an address. Right? So logically speaking, it's really important to understand that the owner of a name is the owner. It just represents who's allowed to make changes to things, who owns that name, who's allowed to do stuff to that name. And the address associated with an ENS name is like if I send ether to that name, right? If we send ether to decentralizationfoundation.eth, that goes to the address, not to the owner, right? So Chris might have his own Ethereum address that he uses because he's got the private key to it and he uses to manage the domain. And Decentralization Foundation might have an address that it keeps its funds in, right? Chris's personal address might be the owner, but the address associated with that name would be the place you want the funds to go. Um, so the owner can make changes, can set stuff. The address is the Ethereum address that the thing represents. When you register a name, all you've done is set an owner. After you register a name, if you want people to be able to use it as an Ethereum address, if you want people to be able to send money to it or use it as a smart contract address or every, anything else, you need to set your resolver and then set the address and all the other stuff on it. Okay, um, so let's go back to the SBT Ethereum command. So here we see that kind of setup. So the first thing that you want to do in ENS um, is you want to register names. So this is ENS name register. That's sort of your main gateway. Um, names are registered now for a certain finite period of time. So you frequently want to also extend them when your time is running out. It's one sort of downside of ENS, unlike with DNS where you have registrars and they send you annoying emails when your domain's about to run out. You've got to monitor this yourself. There's no centralized party that you're paying to send you emails and ask for $35 or whatever they're charging nowadays. Um, so you register your name, you can extend names, um, you can query for what the price of a name for a certain period of time would be, and you can look up the status of names. Um, once names are registered, you can look up the address associated with it, ENS address lookup, or if it's your name, you can set the address associated with it. Um, when a name is registered, you can look up the owner. If you are the owner, you can transfer it. You can reset the owner. Only the owner can do that. Um, you can look up the resolver. And then you can also create subnodes, right? So if Chris has decentralizationfoundation.eth, he can make chris.decentralizationfoundation.eth and um, whoever dot. So you can create subnode that will um, in ENS. And so these are the commands in SPT Ethereum. And I think so now is the time to kind of flip from me spewing crap at you, we've done this one, to, um, to trying this out.